so this time uh, we are going to practice the IQ method using the example of a risk assessment. So you may recall that uh, a few weeks ago I did uh, uh, an IQ on an incident investigation, but this time we are going to use the same example of the incident investigation, but we are going to look at it from the risk assessment perspective, which is not how decisions were made retrospectively, but how decisions should be made as we look ahead. So same principle, IQ method, uh, but a slightly different way of looking at it, same example. So here I am, I will present my screen now. And uh, so as you can see, it's a, it's a blank screen and it's just like the, the whiteboard right behind me. What I'm going to do is I will bring, this is a software I use, which is called Omni Graffle. And um, uh, you can use a whiteboard just like what we have in the back. Now, what's on the whiteboard is, uh, is four quadrants, as, as you will see in the IQ method. Uh, the top quadrant is all about words in the workspace, words that are measurable, words that can be sensed in some way words that can we, we can put our five senses upon. Um, and on the on the left hand side, you have all the positive and the neutral words on, on the right hand side, uh, at the top quadrant, you have all the words and the negative words in the workspace like injury, harm, uh, non compliance, uh, deviation, anything with a negative connotation goes on the on the right hand side. Uh, at the bottom left, we have all the words that are related with individual, individuals' feelings and emotions. And at the bottom right hand, we have all the words related with the, the, the relational uh, stuff. For example, you know, cultural expressions, words that can tell us something about group behavior. And in the center, as you can see, we have, uh, which is the foundation of social psychology of risk, we have uh, one brain and three minds, which basically is a reminder that we are not brain centered when we make decisions. The whole body is involved in making decisions. Our gut, our heart, every part of the body actually makes decisions. This is supported by analytical psychology, but it is also supported by latest neuroscience. And there's a lot of books that you can read to understand the embodied nature of decision making and what it means to be a human being. So let's get started. So uh, when you do a risk assessment, now, first of all, this is not a replacement for, for um, the, the, the formal risk assessment. What it is, is it gives you a, a complementary way to generate discussions from below in the organization. So people, for example, who do the work, who know best how to tackle the risk, uh, have ways uh, to, to address risks. Uh, it is really a, a conversation starter between those people. And it can very beautifully complement with all the top-down risk assessment tem templates. And together you have a formal risk assessment. And if you like, you have a toolbox talk which complements the risk assessment. So two are very complementary in nature and you can use it very intelligently. The, and the way I like to see do is that you put the, the name of the people who have, who have attended this risk assessment or this conversation, you put the date, you put the place, for example, uh, this is a risk assessment done online between two people on so-and-so date. And you can do it exactly like this on, on a whiteboard. And once you finish, all you need to do is just take a picture of this or, or a snapshot of the screen and just file it with your formal risk assessment. And that's your paperwork. Now I'm not going to the detail, going to go into the detail of how effectively it can be used even in the court of law because Dr. Rob Long has done enough work uh, on this to, to support this idea. But uh, uh, suffice it to say that this is not just an operational tool to, to, to have conversation. It works really well if you were at a stage where the, 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 the lawyers start to question the that that your decision making you know what was the the what was the underlying basis for you to make one decision or the other and in such instances 
having a demonstrable way, having a visible, transparent method really, really helps you in the court of law to protect your legal interests. Anyway, I'm not going to go into the details of that because that has been covered by Dr. Rob Long in many of his, 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 his books and, and, and videos. So let's get started with the risk assessment with a particular scenario. Now, the scenario is no different here. It's just the same scenario that we had when I did the incident investigation. Apart from the fact that this time we are not doing an incident investigation, we are doing a risk assessment. So the scenario goes something like this. Uh, this safety officer wants to carry out some hot work in tank number three, which basically means some welding needs to be done in a tank on a ship, but the welder is on leave. The, the welder who is employed by the company, who is regularly on board the ship, or the rig or the asset is on leave. So they need to invite a third party contractor, a supplier who can carry out this job whilst the welder is on leave. And now what the safety officer is seeking is some kind of suggestions and open questions from the rest of the participants who are participating in this risk assessment to find out if what they have thought in their formal risk assessments, if those issues are good enough or do we need to understand wider issues? And you can only do that by checking with people, by asking open-ended questions. And because it is an open-ended question to, to many people, it goes in group space, it goes in the bottom right quadrant. Okay, so question one. When you ask the question, any question or suggestion, one of the crew members says, uh, can we not defer the job until the welder is back? You no, know, for example, by two weeks, by three weeks, by a month, until the welder is back home. Fair question, and that goes in the top left quadrant because there's something that can be measured, that can be observed. Now, the answer to that question from the safety officer is, but the job needs to be done as it's already overdue. So when you hear expressions like job needs to be done or get the job done, it's more or less like a slogan that has become embedded in the company culture in many organizations. So that goes in the bottom right quadrant. So you know that when Ronald asked a question in the workspace, in the physical, the measurable, the response came back in the cultural space. So we know something about the culture of this place now. Now, the second question, um, now once uh, the, the safety offer, officer responds by saying that the job needs to be done as it's already overdue, the answer is from Ronald, okay, in which case I will make sure that the person is competent check his certification, permit to work system, familiarization form, and so on. So you can see they're already having a conversation. And as they're having a conversation, the whiteboard is getting filled in in the right places. Now, this is, these are icons that we get in the IQ kit, but you can use these icons so intelligently to open up conversations, but also to understand the nature of the conversation. As say the safety officer hears Ronald speaking, he senses that he is giving me a workspace response to my question, which is not what I'm after. I want to understand the headspace and the group space or the psychological and cultural issues in this risk assessment, in this opportunity for conversation. So obviously he is not getting that response. So he makes it rather more explicit. This time what he does is he picks up an icon and we have many icons like this that you can use in order to, to generate conversations. And he, he, he picks up one of these, these conversation um, magnets and he places it on the whiteboard and says, Ronald, give me something in group space. I'm not interested in workspace. I'm interested in hearing your thoughts around group space, which is give me something in the cultural space that, that you need to do in which, and, and Ronald immediately picks up the signal because now he understands what is expected from him. And he asked questions like about trust, which is a very relational issue, which is an issue around group space. So he asked the question, why are we trusting this welder, this, this third party suppliers paperwork? Why are we trusting this person when we have never seen him before? And then he also says, what help will he require from us? Now, what is important to understand is this, it takes a little bit of time and effort to understand how to frame questions in headspace and group space. We are very, very good at framing questions in the top left and right quadrant, because that's what we normally do in risk and safety. It's about compliance, it's about control. But what we are not very good at is understanding and framing questions in headspace and group space, which I think is very important. And this is the value that the IQ method adds when you do risk assessments. 
Now, when R Ronald hears, the, the, the safety officer hears that, he says, okay, fair enough, I got your point now. These are great questions. But Ronald, now give me some questions in the headspace. What about the space of feelings and emotions? Can you give me some questions around there so that I can work my way through the risk assessment? And Ronald says, I will ask this person, uh, the, 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 the person who is uh, coming to, to do the welding on board our ship, the third party supplier, how confident are you that you can carry out this job? And what makes you so confident? And when he re responds by saying, well, I've done this many times, that is not an acceptable answer, right? So you can see already how Ronald is responding to those open-ended questions so well. And that happens once we understand and we can listen to the language of workspace, headspace, and group space. Once we can understand the language of what is physical, what is measurable, and where exactly human beings make decisions, which is in the subliminal space, which is in the space and the bottom two quadrants. This is where people usually make decisions, but we are so busy in the top two quadrants most of the times. So what we do is, in order to put, give some meaning or shared meaning to this conversation, we start coding this conversation. So when Ronald says, I've done it many times before, what, or, or when, when, when the, the welder uh, or the supplier responds by saying, I've done it many times before, what Ronald makes of it and what the safety officer makes of it is this is the voice of an expert. This is the, 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 the if you like, the arrogance of, a, of, of an expert who knows it all and is not really un interested in, in, in knowing any more from us, which is a clearly a sign of hubris, which is clearly a sign of, uh, of being overconfident, which can be very dangerous in, in an organization that wants to promote safety. <laughs> Sorry. So the next thing we want to ask is what gifts are we picking up in these conversations? A gift, as I've always said in my past two recordings, a gift is something that was that was given but never asked for. And when we do an IQ, we always listen to things that we never asked for because they prove that our expectations were wrong. The very idea of, of seeking something, expecting something. It, it, it puts us in a trap. But when we are open to listening to what we didn't ask for, we come across more things that we could ever imagine. And I think that's a real, real nice thing in a risk assessment. Now, I can go further, but I don't think there is a need to, to go further. This is a very basic IQ. And maybe one more thing to add is that where do we see the, 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 uh, the tensions in this, in this exercise? So one of the things we very quickly realize is that there's a tension between these two statements. Job needs to be done as it's already overdue, but then ask the question, what new risk may we create by inviting a third party contractor to carry out this job? So you see, we're already thinking now because we have, we have created a culture where things need to be done. Perhaps we need to ask ourselves a simple question, what if we went ahead with this, this decision? What will be the trade-off from that decision? And what the, the IQ does is, and, and many, many um, uh, tools and, and methods that come along with IQ does it, they help us question our assumptions. They help us understand our, 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 the byproducts and trade-offs of our decision, which basically means that if we went ahead with a particular decision, what will be the repercussions? Again, something we never do in forms and checklists because it kind of hides those assumptions. Whereas what a whiteboard does is it makes it so transparent. It makes it so participative. It makes it so engaging to bring all these things out in the open. And to me, this is the value of a risk assessment, a good risk assessment. And it really surfaces all the assumptions in the forefront. And it's intuitive, it's practical, it's doable. And people who do the risk who do, who do the job, who undertake these risks, they really get it well because it's all visual, it's all verbal, and it's all about relationships. I cannot do it by myself. I need at least one more person to, this ex, do, do, to do this exercise. And that is what makes it so enjoyable as against paper exercises that are done mostly on my own. So I hope I've given you enough. Uh, any questions, uh, you can get back to us. Uh, you can get right back to me. Uh, 
this is going on the YouTube channel, but uh, you can find me on, on, on LinkedIn as well as on the company website, uh, novellas.solution. So I hope you enjoyed this. Um, and uh, I, I look forward to, to having a discussion with you at some stage. Thank you very much.